тема сегодняшней лекции – эра науки от нейропротезов к полной эмуляции мозга и аватар УВ. А сейчас хотела бы представить нашего лектора Рэндал Куне, нейробиолог и нейроинженер, создатель теории эмуляции мозга. Давайте поприветствуем. Milestones in this era of the brain. And I have been asked to explain that we're using the C because that's the English version of how we do this in the Avatar project. We're talking about A, B, C, and then D. And um, what I want to say is I want to talk a bit about why it's important to get access to the brain, what sort of projects uh, make it possible, how you would actually implement getting this sort of access that we need to be able to build neuroprosthetics to be able to emulate how a brain works uh, and to go to Avatar C. And I am doing this in four different sections. The first section is where I just talk about the problems, what ways we can solve those problems, um, and that's where I already mentioned in the discussion we had before that this is really about adaptation, being able to adapt better to new challenges. Then I want to talk about which kinds of new technologies and tools are becoming available uh, that are addressing the solutions for those problems. Then the third section is I want to talk a bit about the difficulty and how to approach a big project like this. So what is the mission, what is the method being used here? Um, and then fourth, a little tangent, it's not really a tangent, but a dive into BCI, brain-computer interfaces or brain-machine interfaces as some people say because that is a very um, near-term, applicable way of addressing many of the, uh, the particular matters that were being looked at. Okay, so, oh, here on this slide, on that side there, the, uh, I don't know if there's a laser pointer on here, is there? Oh, yes, okay. What you see here, this is a publication that came out in Popular Science not too long ago. If you're interested in more about the background of who I am and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of that is actually described in here. Um, it's a fairly well done article. Okay. Right, so um, we already talked about this a little bit because we had some time while technical difficulties we were being solved. But uh, one of the things that I was trying to point out is that everything that, uh, that we experience, everything that makes us who we are, the whole sense of being, is really what's being processed inside your mind. If something is not being processed by your mind, if something does not come to you through the senses in your body and then eventually make its way into your brain, then it may as well not exist for you from your point of view. The universe only exists through that processing. And then I like to give examples that I, mean, I often give the same one. If I'm touching something like this microphone here, it's not really that there is something that is touch that's happening from my point of view. What's really happening is that these molecules of the microphone and my finger never even actually collide. They don't even, the atoms there are not bumping together, but some force is creating in a sensor inside my finger an electrical pulse which then travels up my arm and then when it gets to my brain it becomes processed and after it's processed I become aware of it and I interpret it as I'm touching something. So even something as simple as that, this is only possible, you can only be aware of it because it's being processed in your mind. That's an important thing to realize because it means that when we talk about, let's see, I think the next one is about challenges. When we talk about challenges that we face, we can talk about many different kinds of challenges. One challenge is survival, basic survival. And not just for ourselves, but for the human species as a whole, because there are always things that threaten survival of the species. We evolved into a certain epoch, we evolved into a certain time and, and space, into a certain uh, environment, but the environment changes, and not just because of the environmental changes that we talk about these days, like global warming, but also things like this. Uh, a giant meteor impact, for instance, that has had a huge impact, influence on the environment that animals had to live through in the past. Oh, I see that we have light now. And, uh, and, and of course, that meant the extinction of many species. 
So what is supposed to keep us from going extinct if something like that happens? Well, one thing that we could do, for instance, is not to live just on one planet. That would be a good solution because being all in one basket is kind of dangerous. But we're not really well suited to living on other planets because our entire physiology, our body is made to live here. But there are other kinds of, oh, this didn't work. There are other kinds of challenges, um, such as the ability to experience certain things, to be able to experience what it's like to think the way a computer does, to uh, see all of that data that's flowing, to be able to calculate difficult problems that we can't do in our minds right now, um, or even just to experience what it's like to actually be in outer space and to be able to feel what it's like to stand on the moon, which of course an astronaut can't really do because an astronaut uh, has to be inside of a spacesuit because they have to take a piece of Earth with them wherever they go just to survive. So adapting to challenges, that's, that's really what this is about. Um, as I already mentioned earlier when we were talking, I think it's very basic human uh, fe feature to augment ourselves, to try to adapt to new challenges in one way or another. So far we've done this all the time by adapting physically to our environment, but mentally we haven't been, been able to do very much except of course do things like learn how to read and write uh, and, and therefore get a different way of expressing our culture and passing things on from one generation to the next. Um, but it's important that we are able to adapt and that we're able to understand the universe around us. This makes us fairly unique in the animal kingdom. We are the only species that can look out there and understand our place in the universe. Uh, the, the picture in the background is actually a, a new representation of the cluster of galaxies that uh, our galaxy happens to belong to. And so our, our new insight into where we are in the universe Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we adapted into this specific environment and into this specific time, and we still have a lot of limitations. Our memory is limited. We forget things all the time. Our short-term memory is limited, meaning we can only keep somewhere between five and seven items in our memory at the same time in order to work with it. That means we have limited working memory, so the type of problems we can tackle is limited. The speed at which our brains can work is highly limited. Neurons are very slow when you compare that with transistors, for instance. Um, the senses that we have and what sort of things we can actually see, hear, perceive is limited. So there are tons of things that are limited, and then you might say, okay, that doesn't matter. We develop machines to do that. But that means that the machines are the ones that are actually working with that experience, with that data, and not ourselves. It only comes to us once it's been translated to something we can understand. We can notice that, for example, in the sense that we are always taking data and we're then exporting that data into some visual format like a graph so that we can understand what it means because that is a representation that we were evolved to understand. So there are definitely lots of limitations there. So what can you do about that? Well, one thing you could do is you can try to make our minds more adaptable. You can try to address those limitations that exist in our thinking more directly. And how could you do that? Well, the first thing that you need to come to grips with, if you want to be able to do that, is that we can treat the mind as something that's being run on a machine, the brain. The brain being a type of machine, a biological machine. Okay, and so I'm gonna to try to rush, rush ahead a little bit with this one because I feel like I've been going on about the very beginnings for a long time. Um, the approach that is the ultimate way of becoming adaptable is if you can take everything that is going on in this biological machine and make it accessible so that you can read what's happening and you can write to it. Then you can, if you want to, change what's there, read and write just like you do in a computer where you can see every byte, every bit, take it out, put something in. And you can only do that if you have ways of getting access to all of that activity in the brain. It's difficult to do that in biology. We're getting better at it, but it's still very difficult. Ultimately, the problem is that this biological machine wasn't built to be exposing its data. It was not built 
to easily read what's going on and to easily write what's in there. That wasn't part of the original design. I mean, it wasn't designed, it was something that evolved. So ultimately, if you're thinking about complete access, the best way that you could have that is if you could put all of this, the entire machinery, into a substrate where there is total access. Now, the types of substrates that we nowadays think about, of course, are computers, because computers are the sort of places where you write software so you can change anything you want. So that's one way of thinking about it. Now, I'm not saying it has to be a computer of the sort that we think about mostly, but that isn't a bad idea. It isn't a bad thing to think about while we go through this. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that I call that substrate independence. Substrate independent not in the sense that uh, you don't have a substrate, but that you can move from one substrate to another. Use many different substrates that can implement the functions that you're trying to implement. Okay, so we have some evidence that this is actually possible. And I think one of the best examples is the so-called hippocampal neuroprosthesis. That is a prosthetic device that was developed by Ted Berger and his colleagues at University of Southern California that has at least in rats and also in primates been shown to be able to replace the function of a small piece deep inside the brain, inside the so-called hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is very important because the hippocampus is the place where we make so-called episodic memory. That's the memory of sequences. So for us, it's the ability to remember what happened now and then and then and then. So the fact that I'm talking to you right now and that you can remember some of the things that I've said is only possible because your hippocampus is able to form new episodic memories. But many patients have strokes that affect the hippocampus. And if it affects both sides of the hippocampus, then it can happen that they are no longer able to form new episodic memory. That's why this was an interesting thing for them to look into. Could they replace the function of that small piece of the brain? And they showed, yes, they can do it. And how do they do it? They do it by putting electrodes here on the input side and also on the output side of that piece of the brain. So they can record input and they can record output and then they can come up with a way to develop a chip, develop some kind of other substrate that is able to do what this piece of the brain used to do. I'll get into a little bit more detail about how they did that in a moment, but the point just to understand now is because they had successful results in rats and in primates with this, and they're going to be going on into human trials within three years, it shows, sorry. Yeah. How do you want to with your Ultimately, if you have electrodes that can record the activity of neurons and that can stimulate so that they cause neurons to fire, you don't need to read the chemical activity directly. You yeah, only need to... You can record it, but you can't uh, make your own. Um, okay, we, we might have to get into a bit more detail then about what is the significant... Um, activity that's happening in the brain because it's relevant to understand that the chemical activity in the brain, there are two types that are really important. One is localized inside a synapse between presynaptic and postsynaptic where you can, if you want to be a bit more general about it, you can say this is just one way of transporting information from one neuron to another. But if you want to represent it in some other way, say as an electrical signal or as just a mathematical function, you can, of course. Yeah. If you put an electrode near a neuron, then you can sense whether that neuron is very active or not because it'll produce an electric field outside of the neuron. You can sense the electric field and the electric field tells you what's going on inside the neuron. So this is how at the input side you can sense what's going on. On the output side, if you have electrodes that are stimulating, that are creating a strong current, you can cause neurons on this side to fire. So you can make a connection between here and here where activity in the neurons on this side will cause activity of neurons over on this side, regardless of what's been going on chemically in here. So that's 
I guess I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and just talk about this because we're doing it right now anyway. What I'm going to get to later on is this concept of something called system identification. It means that you consider something a black box that you don't know much about. You can look at the inputs and you can look at the output. And then you can come up with a mathematical function that explains why this output occurs when you see that input. That's called a transfer function. So if you are able to record with the electrodes here, and you can watch what's happening over here. Now that's done in intact hippocampus, not in a broken hippocampus. So when the hippocampus is working and you can see what activity happens here, it helps you to be able to predict what is the transfer function in here that explains why when you see this input, you see that output. And when you have such a transfer function, then you can use that transfer function when you deactivate this, for instance, with a chemical lesion, where you make the neurons no longer work in there, then you can cause the output that you're supposed to see for a certain input using that function. That's system identification. It's coming up with a function that explains how that black box works, and that's how Ted Berger and his team did this particular neuroprosthesis. So they didn't need to predict anything about chemical states. They didn't even need to know exactly which neuron is connected with which other neuron. What they did is just have an electrode array on one side and an electrode array on the other. And in the experimental circumstances where they were testing this, this was not in everyday life, but it was in a specific experiment where the rat had to remember from one trial to the next what happened and then which lever to, to go to to get its food reward. In that example, replacing the hippocampus with that chip worked. The rat was able to do its task again. When you turn the chip off, the rat was not able to do it. Turn it on, it's able to do it. What's more, they had a chemical lesion that was reversible, which means that they were able to make the neurons turn back on again. So they could show that the animals were able to do the task whenever the hippocampus was working, the animals were able to do the task whenever the chip was working, they were not able to do it whenever both were off. And in fact, in the primate examples, they showed that when you had both of them on, that they were able to learn the task faster and do better. So there was some enhancement shown in by using the chip with a working hippocampus. So that's why I think this is a very important example to tell people about because it's not in the news a lot for some reason. It's not something that's been publicized a lot and people are still thinking about the brain as something that's very hard to, to deal with, to do something really tangible with. And when we think about hippocampal, uh, sorry, when we think about prostheses and the brain, we often think about something very peripheral such as uh, a cochlear implant or a retinal implant or something to move a, an arm, a, a prosthetic limb. That's all peripheral and it's easier to see why that would work. So talking about something deep inside the brain where the system needs to understand the language of, oh sorry, the language of the brain in terms of what's going on between this part and this part, that's different and it can seem daunting and uh, impossible. And that's why I like to talk about this even though these are just very early trials and very early experiments using a very simple prosthetic device. At least it shows that under these circumstances you can treat the brain as a machine where you can interpret what's going on by looking at the electrical activities that's there and you can replace its function and you can get it to do, you can get the chip to do what the brain part was doing before. This isn't the whole brain not all parts are as easy to deal with as the hippocampus. There are reasons there that I could go into, but the hippocampus is kind of a special area where it's easier to do this. But it's just good to know that there's an actual example of something that has already been tested that shows that you can make replacement parts for the brain. Okay, this is just a terminology thing, so everybody knows what I'm talking about in a moment. Um, so I like to talk about substrate independence, substrate independent minds as this notion that the goal is to be able to take the functions of what's going on in here to other types of devices. Then there's a specific way of doing it which I call whole brain emulation. It's a term that's been around since 1998 and uh, it really just means doing the same thing what we were just talking about in Ted Berger's hippocampal neuroprosthetic, but doing it for an entire brain. So 
you could think of doing lots of neuroprostheses or one really big neuroprosthetic. That's whole brain emulation. Emulation such as, for example, when you have a program that allows you to run programs that were written for a PC and run them on a Macintosh. That's an emulator. You take something that was meant for a different platform and you run it on this platform and you get the same result. And then um, when you do that, when you go from biology to whole brain emulation, that transfer in the popular terminology is often called mind uploading. This is also the process that is necessary to do what we call the avatar C stage, where you go not just to a body prosthetic, but you also produce a prosthetic for the mind. Okay, so we talked a lot about this already, and I'm not going to have to go into it anymore, but I'll take a big quick uh, drink here. Okay, so we did that slide about system identification, and this is where I was going to mention that if you're going to do system identification, an important thing to know is which signals you're looking at. So if you're trying to reverse engineer a computer chip, then you know that the things you're looking at are the ones and zeros, or the high voltages above a certain threshold and the low voltages below a certain threshold. That's very easy to understand. So what is it that you look at inside of a brain? It was actually really good that the question came up about chemistry because it so happens that in the hippocampal prosthetic, it was good enough to just look at the activity of the cells and all that Berger needed to do was come up with a function that could predict when there is spikes happening, so activity of the neuron at this time and this time and this time and this time, what are the times at which we see spikes on the output? So spike timing was the important um, signal in that case. But that's not necessarily always enough. When we're looking at memory in the brain, it might be that we need to look deeper at some points and say, well, what are the chemical changes that we see that express LTP and LTD, long-term potentiation and long-term de uh, depression or things like that going on in the brain? It's entirely possible that there are other signals that are of interest, but you need to start somewhere. So where do you start? Well, as I was already saying, often it's useful to predict neural spikes. For the hippocampal prosthetic, that was enough. For most of the uh, peripheral things like uh, retinal prostheses and cochlear implants and other ways of driving devices, spikes also are the thing you want to look at, these activation peaks of the neuron where, where the neuron fires. Because um, spike trains, the timing of spikes, is really the way that uh, that input coming to us from our senses is translated as it goes into the brain. It's also the way that our brain translates what we want to do in movement to the muscles, and it is the way in which we lay down memory. So we know, for instance, that uh, spike timing dependent potentiation, this notion that when a presynaptic neuron fires and the time that it takes until the postsynaptic neuron fires determines whether or not the synapse between them is going to be strengthened or weakened or stays the same. So spike timing seems to be a very important thing. Now I'm not saying that that is all you need to know, but it seems like a good first model, a good first initial thing to go into. You need to start somewhere, and when you're going to do something as complicated as system identification for the brain, you need to start with a model that is not the most complex one, but one that may be good enough, and then you can go iteratively explore what's missing and add more as you find out more about your system. That's actually the other really important point. If you're trying to do something like whole brain emulation, how do you know when you've achieved it? You need to know what your success criteria are. And an important success criteria here is that we want to be able to maintain, transfer, augment, improve whatever we consider ourselves, self, personality, characteristics that are important to us. And that's not an obvious thing what that is, because for instance, a small child, yourself at five years old, how do you know that that's the same person that you are now? Somehow it feels like it's the same person, but obviously you were thinking very different at the time, you were experiencing things differently, a lot has happened since then, but you see some sort of connection. The same way if someone is going through Alzheimer's disease, up to a certain point we kind of say, well, Grandma still seems like grandma. She still seems like the same person. But then at some point we say, no, there's really something that's wrong now. There's something that's different. She's not herself anymore. She doesn't behave the way that she used to. 
we say that somewhere that gets lost, but where is that? So there are criteria, and these criteria are not fully explained yet. We don't know exactly what we would consider successfully preserving self or not. So you need to start with something. You start with an initial model, and then you need to iteratively test and get better at making your emulations. I already talked a lot about the hippocampus, that hippocampal prosthetic, so I'll move along. Um, okay, now we talked about making a small neuroprosthetic where you can look at the input and output and decide what is the transfer function that explains how input becomes output. But if we're talking about a brain that contains over 80 billion neurons, and that is the correct number, actually, it's not 100 billion, but 80, but what does it matter? Anyway, it's a lot of neurons and trillions of synapses. That's a very big black box. Even if you were to observe all of the inputs to that black box, all of your sensory input, over your entire lifespan, it's very likely that you couldn't come up with the transfer function that explains all of the behaviors, all of the characteristics that, that you could produce with that brain. Partially because many of those things are laid down through development that is genetic and that may never have been expressed through something that you, you came across during your life, but also simply because there are a huge number of parameters in there and the problem of deriving transfer functions from so many parameters is just really gigantic. So that's not doable. But what you can do is you can take a big problem and you can break it down into many small problems. And that's the approach to take there. So you don't just handle one black box. You try to find out what, how can we express it in black boxes small enough to do it successfully. Maybe as small as what Berger was, was dealing with in the hippocampus, maybe smaller, like individual compartments of a compartmental model of a neuron, where a neuron is then composed of a whole ton of these little electrical analogies. Um, or something bigger, if you can abstract more, maybe you can put many neurons together and look at what they're doing. What exactly the best sizes for these black boxes isn't clear yet. We just know that the version that, that Berger used, that happened to work for the hippocampus. But what we do understand is that if you're going to look at this as a problem of many connected subsystems, you need to know how they're connected so that you can start making assumptions about what can talk to what else, which sort of um, input-output transfers are possible from one subsystem to another. And that's connectomics. Okay, so now we have basically a roadmap of how to make a whole brain emulation. We look at the connectome, how are things connected inside the brain. We look at what are the functions. So for each one of these little subsystems, how do we do the system identification for that and decide what's going on inside of this system? Then there is the question, if you can acquire all that data, data about connectome, data about function, what's the best way to convert that into a model? What is the best way to represent what's going on? Because just recording a ton of data obviously isn't good enough and to then also test that and see if it works. Um, and then yes, you want to test all of your assumptions and go back and iterate over that, improve what your models are. So there's, there's all of that involved. And then hardware, you could look at that as well, although hardware is really a problem that's very far away at the moment and uh, not a major concern yet. Not too much I'll say about this slide, except that representation is indeed an issue, but it's, uh, it's not the biggest issue at the moment. What you ultimately have to look for is, in terms of technology, kind of a sweet spot between how complicated can a problem be? How complicated can the black box of a subsystem be that you can analyze and that you can properly explain what's going on? And then how complicated can this mess of black boxes connected be that you can handle it as a computational and mathematical task versus how difficult is it to build new tools that can gather data at increasingly high resolution. Because if you make a tool that can get you higher resolution structure or higher resolution activity data about the brain, it allows you to make your black boxes smaller and therefore to make your system identification problem easier. But making those devices, especially if they're supposed to work on living brains in vivo, is very difficult. So you're trying to find a sweet spot where those two come together. Um, I could talk about what kind of compute power it might take to run a brain. I'm not sure how interested you are in that because it's still kind of far off. But um, and 
uh, yeah, if you were to run it on a supercomputer and if it was done using spike timing as the most important variable and if it was done by doing compartmental models as I showed before with say uh, 10,000 compartments per neuron, uh, then it looks like it would take uh, about 10 petabytes to store all the data that you would need and uh, it, it would take, uh, gosh, I'm actually forgetting how much it was. But yeah, something very large in the amount of, uh, I mean, if you want to be able to run it at normal speed, it would take something about a thousand times as fast as the current fastest supercomputers. But the nice bit of data about that is that it will, that sort of speed is supposed to be here around 2020. So the supercomputing power isn't really the problem. Also, of course, you wouldn't really want to run something like that on a regular supercomputer because we know that it can run on a device that takes only 20 to 40 watts. So there is a better hardware architecture that you could come up with for these things. And maybe neuromorphic computing, something similar to that. Okay, but that's really not our biggest problem right now because why think about how you want to run this thing if you can't get the data yet? The biggest problem is that, tools for the data. Um, what we have today is that neuroscientists can either use something that gives you very low resolution in both time and space, an MRI, telling you something about what's going on in the entire brain, or you can use either electrodes or these arrays that you can grow cells on to get detailed information about what's going on in a few cells, but not a lot of cells in the brain. So that's kind of what we have. This is sort of the problem that you know astronomy faced a few hundred years ago before scientists had good telescopes. Neuroscientists need their telescopes, their version of the new good telescope to do the work that they need to do. And here are some of the projects that are actually getting us there. First, I'm going to talk about getting the structure of the brain, so the connectomics part. Here are some connectome tools. So the first one I want to talk about is so-called DNA barcoding. This is a procedure that was invented by Tony Zador. And the idea is, well, it's not just an idea, they're actually testing this, um, that you have snippets of synthetic DNA so that you know exactly what the code of that DNA is. You can make many, many types of this synthetic DNA so that there are many different codes available. It's like a, a unique identification number that you can put into a neuron. And then a carrier, such as a transsynaptic virus, a virus that can cross one synaptic boundary, can take snippets of this DNA from one neuron to the synapses into the neighboring neuron. It actually gets bound on a, on a process that is between the two synapses, though I'm currently forgetting what that's called because it's not my specialization area. But what you end up with, it's like giving postcards to all of your nearest neighbors. You're sending your identification to all of your nearest neighbors. So then if you go in and you pull out the cells and you sequence all of the snippets of DNA that you find, you find the identification codes for all of the neurons that were connected with that neuron. So that's a way of getting, at least in terms of information of which neurons connected with which other neuron, that would be a good way to do that for a very large number of neurons because biological techniques have the advantage that they're easy to apply to many cells at the same time. You could do that to millions of cells at the same time. Of course, the sort of information you're getting about a connectome from that is not perfect. You're only getting information about neuron A is connected with neuron B, neuron C is connected with neuron D. You don't know what type of connection is that? Is it inhibitory connection? Is it an excitatory connection? What sort of synaptic channels are there? How strong are those connections? You're not getting any of that information from here. Okay, but there are other approaches that are very interesting and coming up. This is just a quick slide because it's really beautiful to see. This is uh, from the uh, Clarity Protocol that uh, people at Stanford recently developed in the Disseroth lab. It uh, is a way of replacing the lipids in the brain so that you can basically make a piece of tissue or a brain tissue transparent and then you can use microscopy techniques to see the individual cell bodies and their axons and dendrites in very high detail in 3D. Um, it is not actually at a resolution that would be good enough to capture the connectome the way we'd like to see it. It doesn't give you where the synapses are, it doesn't give you individual connections. But there are techniques that can do that. Now, this is where it's a little bit sad that uh, it was too technically complicated to set up the movie 
that goes with this because it would show you uh, how you can get great detail over a whole block volume of neural tissue using this technique of electron microscopy. Um, what this method uses is the process of taking a piece of brain tissue, making it hard so that you can cut it. This is plastination is what they call it. Again, they're tr replacing some of the uh, contents of the tissue so that it becomes a hard resin. Then you can either ablate, that is blow away part of the surface, or you can cut it with a diamond knife and then you can use an electron microscope to image the next surface. And then if you get lots and lots of these surfaces, then what you end up with, uh, and I wonder if the next slide can show this better. Let's see. Okay, after you've done this reconstruction of all the images with the electron microscope, and then you identify what the cell bodies are, you identify which are the axons and the dendrites, so the connections between the neurons there, then you can create these reconstructions where you see uh, the cell bodies and which ones approach other cell bodies closely and in fact if you look at the highest resolution five nanometers that you can do with these techniques you can see the individual synapses you can see where they connect to one another you can even see the vesicles those are the little containers inside the synapses that contain the neurotransmitter so that you get an idea of how many of those vesicles are close to the surface of the synapse in other words how strong is that synapse there are the details are good enough that from this you can make some really great predictions. And this was demonstrated in a proof of concept um, by people who work with the Winfried Denk Lab at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, they published some great results uh, two years ago in which they showed that when they did this kind of reconstruction for pieces of the retina, as well as for pieces of visual cortex, they were able to make predictions about the functions of the neurons that they found based on looking at their connectivity. So we know, for example, in the visual cortex that when we see, we're composing our vision out of features that are very basic, such as the ability to see vertical lines or horizontal lines, um, and then cells at the next level combine those to see corners and things like that. And they were able to make those kind of predictions about what those cells do. Now the nice thing about the experiment they did is that before they did the electron microscopy, they were able to use um, calcium dye microscopy to see the activity in the cells of these animals that they used to be able to see how the cells responded to visual stimuli. So they actually knew which cells they were looking at and they took the same tissue and sliced it and put it on an electron microscope and predicted which cells would do what and they had a good correspondence. So in fact this was good enough to get some functional detail. Okay, so connectomics has come quite far. I mean, the biggest problem that there, there still is in that field is that to get the sort of detail we really want, the kind that you're getting out of electron microscopy, you need to deal with a huge number of slices, a very big volume, because the stuff that they did in the Ventry Denk lab, that was really just uh, a few microns in size. It was not the size of a brain. So that's the biggest challenge there, is automating the process to where you can deal with large volumes of brain, do the identification of the things in the images automatically, that sort of challenge. But the bigger challenge is on the functional side because as I pointed out earlier, you still need to do the system identification for each of these subsystems that's there. Now what you really need for that is very high resolution data from a live brain in vivo and you need that across a huge number of cells, preferably every single neuron. Well, the Brain Initiative, that's this project that was launched in the United States recently, at least when it initially started, had exactly that goal. And that's not a coincidence because it was proposed to the White House by a group of scientists who want exactly to recognize the activity of every neuron in a mouse brain. And I'll get into a little bit more about that as we get into the project part of this. But this is where some really cool new stuff is happening on the, on the data side. So one side of this is basically working to expand what neuroscientists are already using. Neuroscientists use these arrays of electrodes that they put inside a brain to record. Now, the most advanced versions of those are optoelectric. That means they use electrodes, but they also shine light down these, uh, these electrodes so that they can use the technique of optogenetics to selectively drive, stimulate, or inhibit uh, certain neurons. This helps when you're trying to know that you are in fact only 
exciting these cells, and so when you're recording, those are the cells that you're looking at. It's a very useful technique with genetically uh, modified animals, such as in certain strains of mice. And then the, the thing you do to get the high resolution is you try to have more of those electrodes. And uh, the most cutting edge electrodes right now that are not yet available for the labs to use but are available in the labs that are producing and testing them are going up to a million electrodes. That's a lot because when you think about the fact that a mouse only has 20 million neurons, that's a pretty large percentage of the neurons. So you get a good idea of what's going on in that volume of, the, of cells. This is, uh, oh, there we go. Another interesting tool is an optical way of looking at what's going on in the brain. In this case, brains that are, that you can completely study by, by applying fluorescence, fluorescent dyes that will activate whenever neurons are active and that show you the activity levels. Um, it's best for small brains that are either easily translucid uh, or who, that are very thin uh, for instance, the nematode C. elegans worm here, that's a worm with only 302 neurons, is a perfect example of something you can study with that. Uh, this was recently developed by a team that was working with a friend of mine who had a, a startup company called Nemalode that wanted to develop this technique. His startup unfortunately ran out of money, but the people at MIT and Harvard who were working with him completed the met method and published it not so long ago. And for these small animals, it looks very promising. I haven't seen the data from it yet, but uh, at least they're able to record from the entire animal while it's moving and track, make sure they're still recording from the same cells. Looks very interesting. Okay. Now, in humans uh, or in animals that have many cells, if you want to get information from every single cell, as we already discussed before, a good tool is often biology because biology is something you can apply at that scale that gets into every single cell. Also, for activity, we have a method that's being developed that uses biology. It's called the molecular ticker tape, being developed at Harvard by the George Church Lab. And the idea there, which is also not just an idea but is in testing phases, is that you have, again, snippets of synthetic DNA where you know what the code is. The synthetic DNA is inserted inside of the cells of each neuron so that um, you can have the synthetic DNA being amplified there, that is amplified in a circular fashion, circular amplification, that's what it's called, so that you get a long strip of DNA where you have repeats of the same synthetic code over and over again. That's why this is called a ticker tape, because in computers, you used to have these long ticker tapes that came out of the back with punched holes in it that would give you information. This is similar, except that the holes in the tape, this time, are errors in the synthetic DNA amplification. And the errors correspond to activity, because you also, in these cells, then have a, um, a voltage-gated channel that will change the probability or the rate of errors made in the amplification depending on the voltage, depending on the activity of the cell. So then when you pull out these, synap these uh, synthetic DNA strands and you look at them, then you have a record that tells you something about what the activity of the cell was at different times by looking at the errors. Okay. Finally, a method that uh, I personally find very promising and interesting is that of, it's basically like the electrodes we were talking about before, but making them even smaller, getting rid of most of the electrode, keeping just the part that records, making them wireless. Wireless free-floating electrodes that can be in the brain that you can put in there in, in large quantities. The nice thing about using electronic technology to try to record is that we really know how to work with it. So in the previous example, the biology, these synthetic, uh, synthetic biology tools are still very recent and um, we don't really have a great handle on how to build systems that will work reliably to record what we want to record and uh, we don't have a very good method of getting the data out. Doing a whole ton of DNA sequencing still takes very, very long. Electronics, on the other hand, we know how to build hierarchies of systems that talk to each other. We know how to get them to give us data in a format that we like to read. We know how fast we can make them, all those sorts of things. So it's a very familiar terrain to work with. If you can make that small enough that you can record from every cell, every neuron in the brain or in a, an animal brain, 
then you would have an amazing tool, not just to gather data for whole brain emulation, but even for brain machine interfaces to be able to interact with what's going on in the brain. Now, there are several labs that are looking at doing this, and there is currently one lab that has a prototype. It's called Neural Dust. The Neural Dust prototype, I have a, it's a simple slide of it up here, and there's gonna be another slide coming right up. Um, it uses ultrasound as the way of communicating with these free-floating probes. Ultrasound is very useful in this case because ultrasound is not absorbed strongly by neural tissue, so using a lot of that to communicate with these wireless uh, transmitters and receivers doesn't heat up the tissue very much because heating up the brain is a, is a major danger when you're trying to do a lot of recording or stimulating in there. Um, so. If you have something that is about the size of a red blood cell, these days you can actually put about as many transistors onto a system like that, that's about eight micron in size, as the number of transistors that were used in the guidance system of the original cruise missile. So you can see that's, that's actually not bad for the sort of computation you might want to do on board uh, if, you're, if you're trying to do uh, something with those devices. Now the, the prototype, the neural dust prototype today, is not as small as that. It's 126 micron, which is still fairly large. It's about the size of 10 neurons. Uh, but shrinking that down to the size of one neuron, or almost the size of one neuron, around 20 micron, is not very difficult. Because right now what they've used is just technology they have available in the lab to do their prototype. But if they were to make the same chips, using standard integrated circuit technology as you use for making computer chips, then they can get it down to the 20 micron scale. So it's looking very promising there. And this is being done at UC Berkeley by a group of uh, scientists that we're corresponding with closely. Okay, so now I wanna say a few things about this project and the method of how to do this. One issue that you can tell is that dealing with Neuroprosthetics, dealing with whole brain emulation is a big project. It's one of those things where you need a lot of different things to be completed, to fall together the right way. And I like to think of this as a lot of different labs doing different things. This is just a grid that I have here of lots of vectors pointing in slightly different directions, giving you this idea that out there is a world of science and people are doing all sorts of stuff. And why are they doing it? Maybe because uh, the, the head of the lab has a certain interest, maybe because grants are being given in a certain way and that makes it likely they want to work in that direction, maybe because there's a hot topic right now and they want to work on that. But if you look at how all of these vectors add up, if you sum them together, that gives you some trends. But trends are not necessarily the same as goals. So if we have a project such as we desc I described before, this roadmap with the many things that we need to have, there are goals in there, but the trends don't necessarily point at the goals. So what do you do about that? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to give these vectors little nudges in a certain direction. Um, and I try to do that uh, by connecting with many of the scientists that are doing the cutting edge work that is interesting to us. So let's have a little look at that. Um, actually, yeah, so I just said that. That's one of the things I try to do from the bottom-up phase is I try to nudge people towards an interest in the problems that are useful to us, the that problems that, that are going on, to try to explain to them that there are other people that are also interested in this problem, to make connections happen, build that network, um, and then also to identify in the roadmap those gaps, areas where there are no labs working on an important thing where maybe there needs to be grant funding, where maybe there needs to be a project created uh, and to find the right experts for that. And uh, this, is, this is something where uh, a project like the Avatar project can be very helpful because it can actually combine so many interests under one umbrella and e explain and demonstrate why it's useful if you put all those together and how you can get across the entire planet many people working together in a way that they previously couldn't do because they simply either didn't know about each other, didn't know about each other's interests, or didn't have the methods, the tools to connect them properly, uh, and of course the funding. So just to give you a little overview of some of the, uh, the sort of connections that have been made, what I try to show here, it's, it's way too complicated to explain in detail right now, but 
This is just sort of in four sections, you see these same roadmap areas that I talked about before. You've got structure, function, you've got that emulation part and the application validation. Then in there we see names. The names are names of researchers at specific labs who are doing things that are relevant to this. But how closely are they involved? Well, there are some people who we, I would consider core partners. Those are people who not only do relevant work, but they're actually interested in the same goal. They would really like to see whole brain emulation. They would really like to see neuroprosthetics happen. They really want to analyze the whole brain. Then you have people who are in what I can call the compatible goals circle. They, they work on technology that we really want to see done, but they're doing it for their own reasons. They have some goal that happens to be compatible with ours, but they're not really into whole brain emulation yet. And then you've got outside there a bunch of things that we need, but no immediate connection that works, no reason why those people are interested in what we're doing. Um, and so we have this in many fields, the, the neural recording field, brain machine interfaces, neuroprosthetics, uh, connectomics, implementations. Some people like Ted Berger at USC with his hippocampal neuroprosthetic kind of overlaps in several areas. He works on hardware for implementation. He does tests with neuroprostheses and, and many other things. And here you have the people with the, uh, with the neural dust stuff in there. Um, and what I have seen over the past few years as I've been making these networks and these connections is that these circles have been expanding. They've been getting bigger. So the core partners is including more people. They're getting interested in that actual same goal. And the compatibles are also moving outwards, which is very good to see. Okay. Yeah, there's a, a term that has become popular for this sort of activity, this making of the right projects and getting these things happening in a cross-disciplinary fashion. We're calling it architecting. It's a term that Ed Boyden at MIT came up with because we sat down and we talked about this problem as a general issue that there is actually not very much encouragement for roles like that. People who not only want to do something in great detail, let's say study a certain type of synapse for 30 years and, and write papers about that, but people who want to understand enough to be able to dig deep on many different topics, but also like to work on a big picture domain and like to make these connections and make projects happen. So this architecting thing. And we're trying actively with, uh, with Ed Boyden and his lab to encourage new ways to make that happen, to get people who have problems to provide funds for these architects to do their work and get the solution people connected with the problem people, uh, make this cross-disciplinary work happen better. And I'll give an example, well, that is if I can get the slide to advance. Uh, what's happening here? Hmm. Not sure what the problem is. Did I break something? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, an example of that kind of architecting and where it worked out. So, um, a few years ago, the biggest problem was to get people interested in not just doing high resolution functional recording in the brain, but to do it on very large scale, to so to come up with new tools that make that possible. That was the biggest goal, problem at the time. And you, I just discussed it. Um, so what happened is that a couple of years ago, I invited Ed Boyden, that's the guy up here from MIT, to come out to Silicon Valley, where I was working at the time. And he gave a talk there, and then we started talking about this problem, about how could you possibly record from every single neuron in a piece of tissue in a brain. We started talking about ideas, and that's actually where the first bit of these ideas of the molecular ticker tape uh, sort of came forward, because the company was involved in DNA sequencing, and Ed was interested in it as well. Um, he did a lot of uh, gene manipulation for optogenetics. And so he went back to MIT with that, and they started a group around it. They started a group around this problem of how would you record from every single neuron. They called this group the, um, I don't know if the name is on here, but it's called the POBAM, oh here it is, POBAM group. That's the physics of brain activity mapping. It involves um, him and his lab, uh, people from Harvard with George Church's lab, Conrad Cording at Northwestern, and a set of other labs where they sit down and they try to look at all of the different technological solutions, which path, which kinds of signals could you record, which sorts of 
processes could you make? Where does it break down? What are the numbers for these things? And then as you encounter hurdles, try to come up with hybrid solutions. How can you use a little bit of this technology to get that far and then the other technology to get around the problem the first one has, which is really a great thing to do. And in that process, it so happens that this guy here, Jose Carmena from UC Berkeley came to me one day and said, Randall, we've been talking for years. A couple of years ago, you talked to me about whole brain emulation. I thought that was just too complicated. I didn't want to think about it. But since then, I've read a few books and now I'm really interested in the problem. And then I, I told him about what Ed Boyden was doing and he said, oh, that's really interesting because I've known Ed for years. We always talk about grant proposals for Parkinson's disease and this and that, but we've never talked about this problem. And so he didn't know that at first, but through this communication, he became acquainted with their project and they had been working on this idea of these wireless ultrasound transmitter and receiver systems for the brain. So the neural dust stuff got incorporated in their project. And that was one really important step. And the other very important step was that this physics of brain activity mapping group, they were the ones who wrote the original proposal that went to the White House that then became the Brain Initiative. So you can see that no matter how small these little pushes are, these little things you can do to nudge those vectors along what every lab is doing and get them in touch with each other, sometimes really beautiful things happen as a result. And I was very happy to see what was coming out of that. And yeah, so one of the results was also this further work on neural dust, which to get into a little more detail, ultimately is going to be 20 micron in size. Right now it's 126. It's being tested in mice this year. Um, they've already added a little tail to the device so that it can read things at the size of five micron because it can get into that kind of size there. Um, it is powered by ultrasound. It also sends information through ultrasound between a transmitter and receiver station that is on the surface of the brain and these tiny little wireless devices that can be inside the tissue. Um, and there are other versions, such as at MIT and Harvard, they're working on one that works with infrared instead of ultrasound. There are different reasons why one technique has an advantage in some cases or in the other. Uh, Conrad Cording at Northwestern is working on a version that involves pulling nanowires through the vasculature in the brain using macrophages to bring them to their targets. And so you can see there are many different things that these groups are doing and talking about at the same time. They're not just sequestered away in their lab working on it alone, and competing with each other, but instead they're sharing their information and they're helping each other get over the hurdles by coming up with hybrid solutions where you use a little bit of this and a little bit of that and do something better. Okay, and now in terms of method, one more thing. It's great to look at whole brain emulation as this, this sort of lab project where you do a very clean thing like scan an entire brain, scan all of the activity, try to come up with a model, but it's very unlikely that you can do that quickly for regular people who aren't patients or for anything that's not an animal, or that you can come up with the right devices very quickly using the grant structures that are available in, in uh, research today because usually you only get to a prototype, then you publish about it, and then you're done. There, these are all problems just with the effective project management of something like that and getting to the scale required, getting to the kind of detail and precision required for the technology. And there are some ways you can get around it. For example, instead of looking at this clean room project of a whole brain, how about brain machine interfaces or brain computer interfaces? The nice thing about this stuff is there are applications that you can have in the near term, very soon, for brain machine interfaces. And the requirements as you try to make them better, as you try to turn them into really useful brain machine interfaces that can do more than just move a cursor for a computer, but instead can, for instance, record what your hippocampus is doing at a certain time and store it away in a library so that you could say, on Tuesday at 12 o'clock, what was I thinking about? And then re-stimulate the cells that were active at that time and get your memory back. We can't do that right now. We can't say, I want to remember what I did on Tuesday at 12 o'clock, because that's not how our memory works. But if you have brain machine interfaces at high resolution, then you can do that. And there are so many other possibilities of what you can do with really good brain machine interfaces, not EEG or anything like that. So this is a way to, to make something that's interesting near term, but it eventually requires the same type of neural interfaces, the same high resolution, large scale stuff, 
that is also required for the data for whole brain emulation. That's why this is a very interesting direction in which to, again, push these little vectors and make people work there or ask them to work there, of course. Okay. Um, I think I already said a few things about that, so I'll just go past this one. Um, and I already talked about how his work in primates has been showing improvement and not just replacement of function. And I guess I already mentioned that his work is going into human trials. So we had a discussion about that earlier. It's, uh, his, his work is in fact going into human trials in three to four years. He got DARPA funding for that. This is Ted Berger. Okay, a quick timeline. So for brain-computer interfaces and, and working directly with the neurons in our brain, this is a bit of a fictitious timeline, of course, but it's a timeline based on what I think is feasible and credible given the, the work that's going on in these new tools. Um, I could see that in two to three years, indeed, there's going to be these trials with the hippocampal prosthetic in humans. Five to eight years, it, I think you would have coming out of work like the physics of brain activity mapping the POBAM group is doing and others in the brain initiative, the kinds of interfaces that would be necessary to make a hippocampal prosthetic that's good enough that it could be used in humans. And if you have a hippocampal prosthetic that is used in humans and that has high resolution recording, then you could do this kind of library of memory vectors as I was just talking about. So that sort of thing might then be possible. And similarly with recording what you're seeing, et cetera. Um, so this means that in maybe up to 10 years, it would be possible to analyze brain circuits in a way that can give us more insight into how people are doing the sort of things that right now we're attempting with, with stuff like uh, uh, deep learning networks and things like that, but give us insight into what makes us still better than many of those systems. Not sure what exactly will come out of it, but the brain analysis should be possible at that level then for larger areas of the brain. In 12 years, eight to 12 years, this should also be helping with motor control prosthesis, being able to bypass anything that's wrong with your, your spine or with areas of your brain that are no longer functioning, such as in Parkinson's disease. And in 14 years, I, I think it, you can apply the same techniques if we have high resolution, large scale neural interfaces, you can make things like retinal prostheses much better than they are today so that you can actually see scenes and not just notice that there's light out there, um, things like that. At the same time, there will be uh, progress in, in using this for augmentation because if you can access the neurons in the brain and deliver data to them, then not only can you use this for recording for the data, but you can also deliver information to the brain that it normally doesn't have access to, such as, let's say, if you want to see in the infrared spectrum or something like that. Um, it gets a little bit speculative out here, but looking at the rate, the pace at which work in connectomics has progressed and is now progressing in the reading of data from live neurons, I think that it is potentially possible in 25 years to make entire prosthetic replacement parts for many areas of the brain because then you can't just deal with the hippocampus, but also with parts of the brain that are more difficult to get into that have a, a bigger recording requirement and stimulating requirement, many more neurons necessary. Hmm. Okay, once again. And I'm going to skip this one, but this was just talking about some of the near-term uses, such as dealing with detection of epileptic seizures or anxiety attacks and uh, helping people sleep or stay awake. Simple things that require not a huge number of electrodes, but maybe just a few. And if they can be applied in a way that isn't highly invasive, then you can use it in many more people. That's actually something that I, I hadn't immediately mentioned, but now that we have people looking at the problem of how to do high-resolution recording, really the next gap in the roadmap has turned into delivery mechanisms because you can use these things in the lab, you can use them in patients who already have a very strong motivation to, to have their, their skull cut open so that they can get work done in there because maybe they need to suppress epileptic seizures or get a deep brain stimulation for, uh, for their tremors or something else like that. But you don't really want to drill into the skull of a normal person who is perfectly fine. Um, so if you want to be able to use these brain-machine interfaces in the general public, then the really important thing is to come up with better delivery methods, even for things that are 20 microns in size. You want to be able to get them where they're supposed to go. And that's really the next big hurdle. Oh, 
Okay, almost there. So I was already closing this up by talking about what can we say looking ahead. Um, but before I talk more about ahead, I just want to mention looking back. If you were to talk to me 10 years ago, at that time, you couldn't talk about whole brain emulation in academia because it was just too complicated. It was too difficult to think about this problem. Now, it's something that a number of researchers are clearly interested in. And this whole goal of recording from every single neuron in the mouse brain at, at one kilohertz resolution, which is the POBAM group's goal, is directly on that target. So there has been a big change in 10 years there. Six years ago, connectomics was getting going, and then we have this proof of principle now where they were able to detect what could be the function of these neurons by looking at their structure. That's how detailed the work was. Three years ago, they started looking at the activity problem that led to the brain initiative, and now we have this method of this problem of, of how to get, uh, get things there, what is the, uh, the delivery mechanism. So we're really at the brink of very new types of devices and tools. Um, we have prototypes of neural prosthetics. We have prototypes of high resolution interfaces. It's very quickly becoming a super active field in which to be, be busy. This is really the decade or maybe even longer, the era of the brain. Now if we just take a peek ahead, okay, we had the connectomic stuff happening here and some of the activity stuff. Now 2013, we saw two big initiatives starting. There was the Human Brain Project in Europe and the Brain Initiative in the US. Um, what's coming up in these next few years? Well, if the, the work that Brain Initiative and groups that are working in the Brain Initiative are doing, if that pans out at the same speed at which results were obtained in the connectomics domain, because in connectomics in five years they made huge advances, then in five years I think we could get the kind of structural data as well as the kind of functional data that would be necessary to, say in 2018, start a project, not finish it, but start a project where you would take something small like the fruit fly drosophila and try to analyze its entire, the structure of its entire brain as well as record from all of the neurons in its brain and try to put it together into a model. So maybe in 2018 we could start a project to try to do the analysis and then the emulation of what goes on in a drosophila brain. That's what I hope anyway. From there on, of course, it's a race then to larger animals and humans. So quickly summarizing, I think that the avatar project and substrate independent minds, which is necessary for avatar C, um, is about improving ourselves. It's about living longer, but also living better, being able to do more and think in ways that we couldn't before. Um, it's a complicated problem and the trends where work tends to go if you just let it go with market forces or with whatever else is driving that doesn't automatically lead to the goals that are necessary for Avatar or Sim. Um, but there are ways that we can help it along. Uh, whole brain emulation is now something that's accepted in labs. Connectomics is, has got proof of concepts. The POBAM group is working on the functional access. Uh, Brain-computer interfaces can be a market-driven way to get rapid improvement in the development of these types of neural interfaces. And, and as I said, maybe in five years we can do something like the Fruit Fly Project. And I want to thank you all for listening to me. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. I hope I didn't speak for way too long. Thank you so much. So do you have time for questions? Is that how we do? Yeah, okay. Пришло время вопросов, поэтому поднимите, пожалуйста, руки, чтобы я видела, кому передать микрофон. А вот молодой человек с первого ряда, вы нам поможете ведь, да, перевести на, с русского на английский спикеру? So, talking about uh, immortality, uh, uh, suggesting we uh, designed a uh, uh, prosthetic brain. Uh, if we make a few copies of this brain and download, downloaded uh, information from one single person, so we have copies, uh, can we be sure that uh, we transformed identity of this person? So, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, a brain immortality is theoretically possible at all, or it's impossible even theoretically, even if we 
design a artificial brain, prosthetic brain, and make copy of uh, one single uh, person. Into so, in your question, you haven't yet really mentioned why you think it might be a problem. So, you said we can make a copy of what's going on in the brain, and if we can make all these perfect copies, then the question is: the question is, uh, can that lead to immortality of the person? Uh, I mean, that uh, can, can we can we uh, be sure that we um, copied his uh, personality? Uh, suggesting we made a copy and killed this uh, person. So we have copies of this person. We have many copies. Uh, we uh, we can't name all of them. This person he was killed. Uh, so uh, they think they are uh, him. They, b everyone believe uh, they are him, but actually we made a copy. Uh, how can we uh, transfer personality, identity of one single person? I see. Okay. Well, in part, your question is a philosophical question because it's a question about what is self, what is identity. Yeah. Um, and that's because it's a philosophical question and not something that has yet been testable empirically, and I don't even know exactly how you test that empirically, um, the answer depends largely on what you believe, first of all. It, it depends, for example, some people have no problem with this at all. They, I, I know my friend Ken Hayworth, he would say, oh, of course, if you make a copy of everything of your memory, and, and then that memory is transferred to somewhere else, um, and it runs the same way, it's giving the same answers, behaves the way that you would, that's you, of course. Why would there be a difference? Anything else is just, you're just kidding yourself. You're just fooling yourself into believing there is something uniquely self. Self is more of a, a process, something generated. In a sense, the feeling that we have a self could be termed an illusion, the same way that we have optical illusions, something where we, we think that I mean, you're watching a movie and you think that things are moving, but really they're just individual scenes that are stuck together. But we get this illusion that there's something moving. The same way the sense of self could be termed an illusion if it's anything beyond your memory and the way you behave. That's what some people would say. Now, others would say, no, there's got to be continuity. So there has to be continuity either in space, because it's important that it's the same cells and that it doesn't suddenly move over here or there has to be continuity in time, you can't turn it off for a while. Now this, of course, starts to beg some questions. In the space case, well, cells are dying a lot and a lot of things change. If we look at this five-year-old that I was putting up before and yourself now, a lot has changed from then to now. So where exactly are things happening that are allowed to happen that preserve self and where aren't they? If you're talking about continuity in time, what happens if someone is, is temporarily brain dead if they're, say, under ice and they're really low cooled and so there's no activity in the brain, they're under for five minutes, maybe longer, there are now hospital procedures that can keep you um, under like that for an hour so they can do operations at you, on you and then bring you back again. Because you were gone for an hour, does that mean yourself disappeared and you actually died and you didn't come back? So these are questions that are sort of beginning to te be tested in reality and people become used to it, kind of like um, when pacemakers first came out, people were really worried because they thought, well, the heart is something so unique. And then when, when heart transplants came out, it was even worse. It was like, does this mean the person is changing because your heart is being replaced? Now we don't even think about that anymore. It's, it's not an issue. Or in the 19th century, when people were worried about what is the elan vital, what is it that makes a bug an alive bug instead of a dead bug, there had to be some magical spark, something that made those two things different. Now, of course, with the reductionist science that we have, as we look closer at it, we look at it and say, well, they're not actually identical besides this spark, because if you look at the cells, you can see that in the dead bug, the cells are no longer quite right, and they wouldn't function even if you tried to you know, revive that bug or something like that. So Elan Vital is no longer concern. So you can imagine that for some people, the way of looking at this is this problem of how does self continue is going to disappear the same way that Elan Vital disappeared because it's really just a way that we're thinking about self right now that is actually the wrong way of thinking about it. It's an illusion. Because what is self? Is self just what's in my body? Is it how I'm interacting with everybody? So do I push that out and say the whole universe is me? Is it something smaller than me? Is it a, a part of my brain or something like that? There are a lot of questions that aren't answered yet, and a lot of it has to do with this way of looking at stuff. I personally, 
have for a long time been a fence sitter on this, so where I thought, okay, I'm not entirely sure if there has to be spatial continuity or something like that. So for me, a process of whole brain emulation that would be more acceptable would be one where you replace, say, little pieces at a time or replace one neuron at a time, keep it connected and running, never turn it off. But then when I think about it more, I realize I'm being kind of silly and not very precise with my thinking about this. So I also go to the other side sometimes. And when people come to me and they, they debate one side of the question, then I often debate the opposite side. I'm always doing the devil's advocate on this. Um, but in recent time, say the last year, I've become really interested in the work that Susan Blackmore has done on things like consciousness and self. If you look at some of the talks that Susan Blackmore has given, uh, her, there are, many of them are online on YouTube, uh, you can see her describing things that she has learned about what consciousness and self are really like that already seem to tell you that there is a lot about it that's not the way we think about it. So this concept of, okay, let's study this more closely and see what's an illusion and what's not there is already really interesting. For example, we think of consciousness as a stream, as something that's going on all the time, but when you really look at what's happening, and there are the experiments by Libet, for example, that show that activity in the brain precedes the notion that we've made a decision to do something. Um, you, you see that consciousness is often more retrospective. It's something where you're just going through your day, kind of doing something, and then when someone alerts you or asks you to be conscious, then you sort of snap into it and you remember what you were thinking a moment ago and that you must have been consciously aware of that at that time. So there are all sorts of aspects of this that really deserve much closer attention and, and can't be answered with our intuitive appeal to what consciousness and self are. So that's, that's one side of that. But I, I think it's not really a fully answered question yet. Thanks. Yeah. Сейчас, девушка, секунду, давайте в микрофон. Uh, but I would like you to go over again the main obstacles uh, in the job that you're doing, because it seems like, uh, you know, if you had like a billion dollars or more, euros, pounds, whatever, uh, would it speed up your work? Or like, can you please go over the obstacles at this point in time? Okay, your question comes both in a form that is very personal, so for my work, and in the form of the project as a whole. And I can immediately tell you that it's certainly where my work is concerned myself, uh, a guaranteed source of funding for this would be amazing because it is very difficult to keep something like this going for many years. I've done this for, for quite a number of years, but how much attention can be put to it depends so much on whether I can devote 100% of my time into it, whether there's a source of funding that takes care of that. So yes, that's very important for me personally. For the project as a whole, also, this, this issue of getting all those vectors pointed there is, of course, much easier if you can promise people funding for something because all of the researchers in those labs also have to make sure that they can feed their families and that they can hire postdocs and all that sort of thing. Now, if they can do it to work on the project there that the government says is interesting right now, they'll do that. Not necessarily. Some of them have very personal ideas about what they want to do, but generally speaking, it pushes things in a certain direction. So if you can provide funding, then indeed it really helps to move things in the direction that you want it to go. So yes, I agree that that, that is actually a very big issue, having a successive, uh, a reliable long-term source of good funding for these projects is important. Um, other big hurdles, well, they are technical. So there's the technical hurdle of how do you actually make a good delivery method? How do you make the good recording method? And in, again, it has a lot to do with robustness of the project. So for instance, you don't want to have just one team exploring this method, because what if that team stops doing it because either the main researcher had some sort of personal incident and had to leave their job or, or died, that's the worst case scenario, uh, or maybe there is something happening in that country and they can't do their work anymore, there's economic instability. So if you have just one group of people doing something, it's a big risk that something won't get done. Also, if you're trying to resolve an issue like how do I record for many neurons at a time, you don't want just one method. You want to have many different horses in the race. You want different methods that can all achieve the result that you're looking for, partly because some may not get there and partly because, as I mentioned, hybrid solutions are often useful where you use many things together. So from a project standpoint, uh, 
I look in many different ways, in terms of monetary resources, in terms of researchers doing the work and labs doing the work and methods, always at the problem of robustness. What is going to be able to get a big project like this all the way through from beginning to end? So a brain, brain basically is a uh, trainable thing. You know, you can train it, you develop it, right? So. So are there any types of research or any projects that would focus on developing particular types of activity within the brain, you know, so to make brain better at specific things and functions? Uh, yes. Yes, there are. Um, so in, even in just the same field that I already mentioned, brain-computer interfaces, that is actually the largest part of the work that's being done. The sort of work that, uh, that Ted Berger does, where he tries to get a system to understand what the brain is talking about, is very rare. Most brain-computer interface work makes the brain do all the heavy lifting. So, for example, if you're going to steer a new prosthetic arm, what often happens in this research is you insert an electrode, and then the brain learns how to use that electrode to move the arm in the right way. But the brain does all of the training, does all the learning. And then similarly, of course, outside of brain-machine interfacing, there are lots of attempts to help people be able to remember things better, like brain training games and stuff like that. Um, so there are efforts along those lines. That's very um, simple, though. I mean, it's nothing, nothing major. Like It's not like trying to teach the brain to remember more things at once, like have larger working memory. There are some trials that attempt to expand your working memory, but it's not quite clear if that is actually possible. I personally think it's impossible because I've studied working memory for quite a long time, uh, and it seems to depend on intrinsic timing of that's very physiological inside the cells that causes oscillations at certain rates. So for example, a neuron will be active and then it has an after hyperpolarization, a period where it cannot fire, that is of a certain duration. And that kind of tells you something about how fast can neurons fire in a row. Then there's recurrent inhibition that keeps networks inactive for a certain amount of time and you can't really get above that. So because you have these very fixed timings in the brain that are physiological, that depend on the recovery rate of neurons, and you have oscillations, large-scale oscillations, like the alpha, beta, theta oscillations in the brain that are of certain duration, you can only put so many events in each one of these big cycles. And that is the sort of thing that ultimately constrains something like your working memory to how many items can you hold in and keep repeating and keep active. So there are physiological constraints that you cannot get over. You can do a lot of things to train to to be able to do good things with the faculties our brain already has. But there are going to be some things that you're not going to be able to do. For example, there is no way that you can train the brain to think 100 times faster because neurons can only fire at a certain speed. So some things, yes, you can train the brain to do. Some things, no, simply physiological limitations. So uh, I, I write music, basically. I compo I'm a composer. And my question is that, for instance, you're listening to the music, right? And music somehow translate in, translates into visual images. Why is it happening? <laughs> 
or sometimes you're looking at something and that translates into music in your mind. So why is it happening? Sound, basically being just a wave, right? How come that we sort of like or dislike a particular sound despite the fact that it's just a wavelength, right? Are there any research in this area that would, you know, elaborate on that? Yes, um, I'll treat that as two separate questions. One of the questions is, how does a specific sound or tune connect with some visual imagery? And the other one is the question of why do we like some images or some visuals, like some art, or why do we like some sounds and not others? Uh, so the first one, the connection between them, there are actually two, two different forms of that. One is just the normal associative recall that we have, where if we've experienced things in our past, then we, are, we have a, a set of connections already set up between different patterns that are memories stored in our brain, and they can connect things like, for instance, the color of a rose and the smell of a rose, or the sound of a symphony orchestra, and this sensation of sitting in this beautiful room and listening to it. Those sort of normal associations, that's, that's exactly what memory does. It builds concepts that allow us to understand the world around us by combining things from different faculties. Then, of course, there is this phenomenon of synesthesia, where you can have a real visual sensation that happens with what you're hearing. Or you can, have, you can have synesthesia along all kinds of senses. You can have smells that appear to you as you're listening to something. Now, synesthesia isn't very well understood, but there is a strong suspicion that it has to do with pathways, connections existing where they don't normally exist. And some of the evidence for that comes, for example, from people who develop synesthesia after they've had epileptic seizures. In an epileptic seizure, you get a very powerful activation of large areas of the brain, many neurons firing at once. Now we know from our Hebbian learning, of course, that what fires together, wires together. So neurons that fire at the same time tend to create connections. So you can imagine that if this is true, that in an epileptic seizure, areas that don't normally have strong connections like that could form connections, and then suddenly you have synesthetic experiences. I don't know if this is the actual answer to it, but it is one that seems like a good direction in which to do research. Now the other question, why do we like some things and not others? That's very complicated and I don't think there's as much research that has been done in it, but I do know a few people who are doing research about it. There is a guy by the name of Mike Johnson at Stanford, for instance, who is researching um, the, this notion of uh, how, what makes something pleasant or less pleasant. What's pleasure? And he has been looking at it in a variety of ways and has come to this preliminary conclusion that pleasantness may have something to do with how much um, something is a, a regular pattern, something that is predictable, highly compressible, versus something that is complex, that has a lot of asynchrony in it, a lot of unpredictable things. And from music, that is something that kind of correlates with that. So you can sort of see where that might fit there. It's not as clear to me how that translates to every other domain of pleasantness, but it's some really promising work. And it, it just so happens that I'm actually working with him on a paper because we're trying to define a couple of basic elements that you could use to describe what puts together concepts or qualia in our minds. So for example, this notion of pleasantness could be associated with pattern uh, pattern um, predictability or compressibility, whereas, for instance, arousal, another dimension, can be combined with the amount of amplitude or strength of something that is being detected. And you could have a number of these dimensions, and when you put them together, you can create concepts that are higher level concepts, qualia that are higher level qualia that connect things there. So that's an area we're looking into, but um, very, very preliminary stuff. And I'm not sure that there's a lot of research there. Спасибо. Вот молодой человек, Денис, тоже нужно его перевести. А, да, 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 говорите, 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 я слушаю. Когда мозг насыщен миром протезами, человек становится зависимым. So, uh, when you have too much stuff connected to your brain, like too many neuroprosthetics, uh, 
it's like you become dependent on this, oh. right? And what if one of your neuroprosthetics just basically burns out? Uh, do you experience pain or negative uh, some sensation because it's just burned out? Or, or is it just like whatever? Mm. Or it's just like, it's like you're just a wedding vegetable, you just, you just go down and you just go blank, or just, you just die. What, what happens when neuroprosthetics just, you know, doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, of course, if you're using neuroprosthetics, you become dependent on neuroprosthetics, just like you're dependent on parts of your brain now. Now, if we look at what happens in people who lose a piece of their brain, someone who has a stroke in the brain or they have an injury and a piece of the brain becomes damaged, that damage in the brain itself ordinarily does not produce a lot of pain because we don't have pain receptors inside the brain. So it is possible that you wouldn't notice. In fact, one of the thought experiments um, that is often mentioned for how we perceive the world and what we're actually conscious of and what makes ourselves talks about this problem of, okay, something that is very characteristic of me, for instance, is that I understand English, German, Dutch, and a little bit of French. That's part of my character is that I have those languages. I don't understand Russian, unfortunately. Sorry. Now, if I'm walking along and I suddenly have a hemorrhage in my brain in the, in the uh, Broca's area and I can't understand English anymore, because there are no pain receptors in the brain, it's entirely possible that I will not know that anything has changed about me up until the moment I try to speak. So what does that say about what makes self and how much that sense of self is something about consciousness? versus memory, where memory is things like stored patterns about understanding languages. And that's where things shift towards this notion of maybe it's more about the memory and not so much about this ongoing sense of being awake. Because something big did just change there, even though I didn't notice it while I was consciously going along my day before I had to speak. So I, I just tied that into that other question because it happened to work well, but uh, I hope that answered part of what you were trying to ask. Вы знаете, давайте в виде исключения у нас с, с онлайн-трансляции пришел вопрос. Сейчас, Денис, я вас попрошу его озвучить. Uh, right. So it's a question from uh, it's online question. So uh, the question is about your opinion about neuro online, basically. You know what I mean, right? It's, it's basically the internet, the neuro internet. Let's call it that way. Of Is the there a neural internet? Yeah, neural internet of the future. What's the future. your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I had, honestly, I had never heard of it before. So I don't have a specific opinion about it. I can make an opinion right now. Um, let me try to understand and think what that might mean. A neural internet of the future. Uh, okay. Okay, the web where everyone's connected to each other. Uh, well, mm -hmm. so you can, okay, maybe, maybe you can communicate directly with devices, you can communicate directly with people, you can maybe even show them what you're seeing right now, something like that. I can imagine those sort of things. Um, to be honest, I never really thought hard about whether that would suddenly be a hugely different world because I always thought of it as something that is a gradual increase of our connectedness. I think that ever since humans became able to speak, we've been improving how connected we are. We've been connecting ourselves more and more with each other because sure, you can do it directly from brain to brain or brain to an internet and to a brain or through uploaded brains to another brain, but you can also do that by communicating your thoughts on a social network and reading about them. And so it seems like it's just a constant evolution in how fast these things spread from one person to another and how precisely you can convey your, what you're trying to convey or how precisely you can document what you're trying to document. Um, if, it ha if there was a big change in how connected we are overnight from today to tomorrow, I think that could be a huge change. But if we're going through it as we go through it now, uh, maybe at a slightly increased rate, uh, 
I think this is something that becomes part of what human society is. It becomes something we expect. Um, so yeah, the honest truth is I don't have any really good ideas about it because I haven't sat down and thought about it for a few days or something like that. Спасибо. Вот молодой человек, на первом ряду, вам требуется переводчик? I have a philosophical question. Um, uh, later, in the beginning of your presentation, you talk about uh, the determination by our physiology or our morphology of the brain, and this is the obstacle to the way of for understanding very big scientific ideas. And uh, I imagine maybe we don't need some one or two or three big uh, biomechanical super brains for understanding the cosmology or something like that. Maybe we need more educated, maybe more uh, smart scientists for this problem. Or in the future, I can imagine some people who have uh, narrow processors for watching four TV shows at the time. And this is, uh, looks like <laughs> yeah, yeah. horrible. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you might be right. I mean, maybe everything that relates to science, to understanding physics or something like that, maybe all of that is understandable if you work hard enough at it with the brain that we have right now, especially if you work hard at it in large groups of people, putting all their brains together, because of course we've already made super intelligences by putting lots of people together in ways and getting them to work in, in specialized expertise that you normally don't have time to develop if you're gonna do all of it yourself. So that may be true, um, but still, there, that doesn't leave out the fact that I cannot really experience things in the same way that a device that is built to experience a different configuration of information or to be able to experience at once, for example, what it's like to think in 15 dimensions instead of thinking in two or three dimensions, barely two or three, maybe two and a half dimensions as we usually do as we go through life. And I can't predict what it's like to experience that because nobody can at the moment. Um, so my desire is more one of exploring where this can go, not saying that then we can figure out this stuff that we can't figure out right now. Uh, so a lot of it for me personally has to do with being on a road towards understanding everything and creating anything. Um, not that we're there or are ever at that goal, but being on that road is something that's very interesting to me. So that's my interest, yeah. Спасибо. Вот я сзади обещала мужчине уже давно. Вам нужен переводчик? Uh, so, uh -huh. so it's a sort of a question from the past because I've been dealing with this issues like for many decades, you know. And I remember that back then when the first sort of our brain maps were developed, uh, as of late 70s and 80s, you know, it was more of a, you know, which one's better, you know, computer versus human brain. And and what you've said that the neural dust and all this stuff that you embed, it's more of a like a, a recording devices, right? mostly, but what about more of a psychic things like intuition development or intuitive counter action versus the inputs, things like more of a psychic nature? I mean, what about that front? Mm -hmm. 
or is is there such thing as intuition in the first place? What, what's your what's your point on that? And if 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 yes, if if it exists, can you can you enhance it with these things? Yes, there is intuition. I experience intuition from time to time. Of course, it depends whether I believe in intuition. Depends a lot on what your definition is of intuition, because when I think of intuition, I think of something like anticipations that I have, or things that, uh, that I, I think of, but I don't know exactly why I thought of them or where they came from. Now, I don't know what intuition is, because I haven't researched it, and in fact, I don't really know anyone who researches intuition, although I'm sure there are. Um, my suspicion is that intuition has a lot to do with becoming aware of results of things that your brain has thought about without knowing exactly what all the processes are. Because, of course, most of what we're doing all the time, this is all subconscious processing, and we're only aware of a tiny fragment of what goes on in our brain. So it's not surprising that there should be things, output, results, stuff that pops up in our mind that we don't know exactly where it came from. I mean, why would that be surprising? Even in our visual system, we're not aware of how all those pieces are being put together until we see an image in our, in, you know, in our mind's eye, as it were, even though we know that it doesn't just get there by magic. It gets there through a bunch of different steps. So I'm suspecting that whatever we're experiencing as intuition comes about through something similar, a set of subconscious processes that eventually lead to some result that we then apply and that sometimes is useful to us and sometimes less useful. Now, um, how that relates directly to the question of making recording devices isn't clear to me because making recording devices for the brain is of course useful for anything that occurs in the brain. And unless we were to assume that intuition is not related to mechanisms of the brain, it should also be something you can investigate by recording and stimulating in the brain. And things like neural dust, they're just an improvement on an existing technology on recording, that's clear. There are, of course, changes since the 1970s because, for instance, in the 1970s, you didn't have someone who could build a prosthetic replacement part for a bit of the hippocampus or something like that and show in experiments that it works. So yes, there is sometimes progress there, but I'm not sure about the intuition question directly. Thanks. <laughs> Uh -huh. so, uh, because as I'm a psychologist, so I can give you the definition of intuition. Uh, so uh, intuition basically is a, a kind of a, a folded chain of logical events. Let's call it that way. So, are you? Uh, my question to you specifically: Are you into any specific research that focuses on ability to register and record? subconscious events or sequences of subconscious events? I'm interested in research that records what goes on in the brain. In other words, all of the events in the brain that constitute our thinking, that constitute how thoughts are made, how memories are stored, how perception works, how consciousness works, all of that. And for so far as we know, at the moment, that all depends on networks of neurons how they communicate with one another, chemicals that are being used in the neurotransmitters, chemicals that are being used across larger areas, these modulatory, diffuse chemicals that are either suppressing or enhancing activity, um, the interaction with glial cells that help with that kind of modulatory activity. So there are an enormous number of processes in the brain, and for as far as we know, these processes, these physiological processes, are involved in subconscious activity, in conscious activity, in unconscious activity, in uh, perception and everything else you want to talk about. So, 
I'm of course interested in all of those, but at the level of what is the mechanism underneath it in the neuroscience sense. So what is it that produces this emergent cognitive behavior? Друзья, у нас последние два вопроса. Ну, очень-очень много, мы просто не уйдем иначе отсюда никогда. So uh, let's imagine that you can actually upload your brain activity, yeah, what you call being, into a uh, sub, no, some kind of a net, sub, sub, substract, some kind of a network, right? And you can do it with each and every guy, basically. So you have like a connected network of selves, of, of these uh, brain activities. So I can actually monitor therefore, and I can realize my self and all other guys. So does it mean that collectively we use this compounding effect, amplification, and use a collective wisdom? So does, does it generate that collective wisdom if we can upload our conscience into this connected network where we, each and other, can realize each other and therefore be connected and, you know, get stronger like that? I don't have any very good answers for you because that uh, goes beyond what I've had the time to properly think about. That being said, um, I think, of course, whenever we closely connect with other people, when we closely try to collaborate and understand each other, it always ends up producing, at least that's what we hope, something more than what the individual is, either in insight or in what we can do which is the whole basis for why a society with more than one person in it can achieve more than just one person. Um, there are all sorts of side issues there. For example, how does it differ if you have even closer connections, if you can see through each other's eyes, if you can uh, try to experience the emotions that someone else is experiencing, how does that affect your ability to understand one another? How does it change how we feel about each other and what we can do together. Um, and, and things like, well, what happens if we have 10 copies of the same person? Are those 10 copies together able to do more than that one particular person would be able to do, even though they all start with the same thoughts and the same preconceptions and biases? So for me, that's a, that's a huge area of exploration, but it's one where I can say very little about my exact expectations of what would come out of it. I can only base my expectations on, on analogies from the past and changes we've seen as we've gone to an increasingly larger society with more global working together and faster communication and, and all that sort of thing. And I do see some interesting things there. I mean, we've seen an evolution over time of, of putting more attention into, for example, um, seeing each other all as human beings and not saying this is a human being and that's not. We've tried to improve how, em, how we empathize with that and therefore that we try to do no harm or try to help people to get along better. And if you, you know, you can be negative about it and say there's still a lot of terrible things that are happening in the world, but on the upside, um, you know, I mean, a lot of things that were completely normal and assumed to be, be totally normal like slavery, we've slowly been getting rid of that. And, I think there's a, there's a trend towards some good insights that you might not get from not being well connected. If we all live in individual little tribes of just a few families, I think it doesn't give as much insight into a better understanding of humanity and, and even of things that humanity is trying to achieve as it does when you have more con communication between cultures and people. So I'm just making that analogy with the past and saying if we take that, those sort of advances, and look into the future with even more connection, maybe there are some 
improvements that would make us look barbaric by comparison when someone in the future looks back and says, before we had uploading, before we were all really connected, oh my God, look at the terrible things we were thinking and doing. So, yeah. А, подождите секунду. Вы знаете, я вот тут подумала, что последний вопрос, наверное, имеет смысл дать девушке, потому что женская половина нашего зала сегодня почему-то молчит. Please excuse my maybe off topic and a little bit stupid question, not to offend any scientists that are in the audience. Um, there is a popular idea that is popularized by Hollywood movies that we're using only five to seven percent of our brain and that we may take something that uh, could uh, that we could use up to hundred percent of our capacity of our brain. Like limitless? Like that or Lucy just recently um, recent movie. So what is your personal opinion about this? Is this actually an idea that might might mm. exist or is just complete imagination of the script writers? And also the second part is, is that we're already using 100% of our brain capacity and it's just five or seven percent that is that we are aware of and the rest is subconscious. So Yeah, that I'll, I'll ask answer the second part first because how you interpret this, this popular conception of the 10% or 5% of whatever it is can differ. Some people would interpret it as, you know, what we're aware of, of what we're doing with our brain, and other we, people would interpret it as what we're actually using, um, things like that. So the answer there is it depends on, on people's interpretation. Now, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure of this, this is just a popular myth. It is not true. You can, of course, improve your, your, your functioning over a short period of time under certain circumstances. This is a little bit like the limitless thing by taking something like modafinil, for example, because you know, you're going to set up your neurons in a state where they're more ready to fire, where they're kind of activated more, where you're more aware and awake and you're not falling asleep and almost unable to concentrate. But that's completely different from suddenly tapping into a vast unexplored potential of the brain that isn't there. So what would actually happen if, let's see, how, how could I interpret this whole 10% myth? If I were to think that what they're talking about is how many neurons can be active at the same time, then if we activated 100% of our neurons at the same time, that would be one incredibly strong epileptic seizure. Because that's what happens when all of the neurons activate at the same time. That's an epilepsy, it's like huge bursts of firing all over the brain. Um, that doesn't work. The way that the brain works is through patterns. And patterns necessarily have to be some off and some on to mean anything. And if you want to be able to use different regions of your brain for different purposes, then you can't have them all activated at the same time because some things involve different functions and different stored memories, etc. So it makes perfect sense that we're always only using a portion of the brain at one time. But it's not true that there are any parts of our brain that are just sitting there empty and inactive, unless, of course, you have some kind of brain damage where some part of the brain could no longer be receiving oxygen or could no longer be receiving pathways of activity that are sensible. But under normal circumstances, it's actually lower. If you look at a, at a, a set of neurons, then you usually wouldn't see more than 2% activity at one point in time. And, and that makes entire sense to me. It's, it's completely okay. I wouldn't want there to be more activity at once. Спасибо вам большое. Благодарим вас. Наверное, давайте, может быть, лектору похлопаем. Thank you. За прекрасную лекцию. А у меня будет небольшое объявление, так как октябрь у нас очень насыщен мероприятиями, поэтому следующая лекция у нас состоится уже 17 октября, в эту пятницу. К нам приезжает в гости нейрофизиолог Михаил Лебедев. Он является разработчиком нейрокомпьютерных интерфейсов из университета Дьюка, США. Тема у нас будет «Моторный контроль и пять чувств для искусственного тела протеза человека». Приходите, лекция будет на русском языке. И большая просьба оставить все оборудование для синхронного перевода у нас. Не забирайте его. Спасибо вам.